Not many of you may know the, the true origin story of Sarah and my dating relationship. Um, we did go to high school together, so we had that little bit of a history. Uh, we went to LA Baptist, smaller Christian high school, and it was small enough to where you know pretty much the people's names in your classes, even if you don't know everybody well. And our senior year, we had four classes together. Our senior year, our lockers were right next to one another. And yet in the midst of the four years of high school, we never spoke to each other. Uh, I knew about Sarah Hankowski. She knew about Brad Sarian. That was about it. Uh, we, we, we didn't talk much. It wasn't until two years later, we were at a mutual friend's going away party. She was going off to college. Um, and Ashley, she invited Sarah, because she was friends with Sarah, and invited me and some others. And I get to this party, um, about 20 years old, and I'm at this party, and I see Sarah Hankowski across the room, and I'm like, wow, she's cuter than I remember. Um, and I'm with one of my buddies, and we're playing ping pong, and I, he keeps saying, dude, you go talk to Sarah, go talk to Sarah, go talk to Sarah. And I was like, I don't know, man. She's with her friend, and sure enough, I worked up the courage to walk across the room, I say hi to her and her friend, and uh, we say, we talk for maybe a minute before her friend turns to me and says, hey, Brad, what do you think about women being pastors? And I was like, hey, this is quite a party conversation. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think they're supposed to be. I think the Bible is pretty clear on that. And, you know, I, I went to Grace Community Church with John MacArthur in high school. So I'm very influenced by his teachings and the culture there that, that men only are, are pastors. But if I was honest in that moment, which I wasn't very honest, I was trying to impress them rather than actually just be honest that I don't know a lot. I just said, the Bible's really clear about that. Women, you know, women just can't be pastors. Um, there's some verses in there that, you know, you should know. And uh, her, her friend said, well, Sarah actually goes to a church that has women pastors. And I was like, oh, no. Um, like, like legitimately, my, my heart was just like, ah, oh, she seemed so promising. But that's, that's, that's kind of the, the nail in the coffin. Like, maybe she's not saved. Genuinely. Like, I don't know, she, I don't know how real this is. And that's, that's where I was at. And so, um, but because she was really cute and she seemed to love Jesus, I was like, how, how about this? I'll Facebook message you later with some of them. I'll, I'll, I'll think through some stuff and I'll Facebook message you later, right? And so later on that night, get home and Facebook message her with like a link to like a gotquestions.org article that said why women can't be pastors. So I was like, hey, this is, this, these are my beliefs, you know, and so it just kind of sent her this article. And I thought that'd be the end. And she's like, wow, you're just so smart. We should date, you know. Um, and, and she didn't. She, she responded with like some legit biblical arguments. And, and now the reason I actually, this is so fresh in my mind is because I have the Word document of all of our Facebook messages still saved on my computer. So I was looking at them this week and I was so humiliated by them. I'm going to put them up for my wife to see. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, they are beyond embarrassing. Uh, but but I, I, was, I was shocked. She, she kind of pushed back and I was like, whoa, easy, you know? What about this authority stuff? And, and so I, I kind of go back, we go back and forth for a, for a few days, Bible verses, just back and forth, back and forth. Um, and she's, she's respectful and just like, you know, I think you might be wrong on this. And I'm saying weird arguments that now I just look at and just go, Jesus, sorry. Um, but, but she was gracious. And then I, finally, it was like a week later, I was like, this girl seems to really love Jesus. She knows her Bible and she's hot. Like, don't ruin this, Brad. Like, this is, like, don't ruin this over this. And so I just was like, hey, anyways, um, let's get lunch sometimes. And so we ended up getting lunch. And we never talked about it again, basically. Um, and, and yet, oh, that was 15 years ago. Over the last 15 years, we have had conversations where ultimately I, I did. I kind of convinced her that, hey, men can only be pastors. Um, the husband really does lead the home. And here's the structure. Here's Ephesians 5. Here's 1 Timothy 2. Here are all the passages. Uh, and she was very much like, cool, sounds good. Um, fast forward, it was in 2013. I read a book by John Dixon called Hearing Her Voice. This was while we were pastoring. I was pastor in San Diego. And at that time, um, I did not believe that women could even preach. Most of you were here this morning. Allie preached. Back in 2013, I didn't think a woman could even preach because of the New Testament. Um, some of the passages, but I read uh, Hearing Her Voice. There, there was a three-part series. Kathy Keller wrote one. Um, I should know these names, but Kathy Keller wrote one. 
John Dixon wrote another, and then Michael Byrd wrote another. And they were three different views on women in ministry. Kathy Keller, uh, Tim Keller's wife, was arguing that women cannot preach sermons and cannot be elders or pastors. John Dixon was in the middle, and he said that women cannot be pastors or elders, but they can preach sermons. I had never heard that. And then Michael Byrd said, women can preach and women can be elders. And so I read all three of them, and I just have an affinity to being in the middle, you know? So I was like, I like this guy. Like, he's, he's saying that, no, they can't be elders, but they can preach. And so I was convinced by his arguments, women can preach. So we moved from it Restored San Diego. We began having women preaching sermons. Um, then fast forward to 2019, uh, I read a book called Paul and Gender by Cynthia Long Westfall. Uh, I'd been very highly influenced by the Bible Project, Tim Mackey, who leads the Bible Project. And on a YouTube video, I heard that he believed that women could be pastors and elders. And now Tim Mackey, I was like, this is one of the smartest Bible guys out there. And he thinks women can be pastors and elders. Whoa, what's, what's going on here? And in an interview, he said, you have to read Paul and Gender by Cynthia Long Westfall. This is the book that kind of helped switch him from male-only elders to women elders. And I was like, I got to read that. So I read that in 2019. Um, first, first deep book I really read from the egalitarian mutualist perspective, and, and it was shocking that I had built most of my life on this one view without ever really examining the other side. She, she was the first Bible scholar that I had read in depth, and I was like, whoa. Um, now, she didn't answer every one of my questions, but, but it was this moment where I finished reading that book, and I was shaken to my core of like, I don't think I know this topic as well as I thought I do. Um, God even did some serious work in my heart and in my soul around just even some buried sexism that I had carried. Grow, growing up in, in, in a culture um, where, where I would hear a phrase almost weekly that it's a man's world. Uh, that was just a phrase that I, I heard often. And I would be foolish to th- believe that that didn't have any impact on my way that I viewed men and women. And so that book kind of began uprooting some stuff and caused me to, to repent about sexism in my heart of, of my view that I, I, I really did believe that men may carry some greater weight or, or be greater of some sort, even though I would have never vocalized it. I was like, uh-oh, this is ugly. And yet it didn't convince me that women should be elders. She didn't actually do a great job in the book saying this is why women should be elders. She was just arguing First um, Timothy 2 and women leading and preaching to some degree. So I finished that book and I was like, whoa, that was a lot. This is ugly but I'm still not convinced, put it on the shelf. Fast forward two more years, 2021. I'm in seminary and a syllabus came out and we had to choose one of the books to write a paper on. And I chose the book, Two Views on Women in Ministry. The reason I chose this book was I I was still complementarian that I believe that male only, men only could be elders, but I had begun to feel so many inconsistencies in my view that I, I, I wanted to read a book that had both perspectives in the same book. And so um, the, the book is called Two Views on Women in Ministry, and it has four different Bible scholars, two on the complementarian perspective, and then two on the mutualist perspective. All Christians, all evangelicals, all seminary professors, brilliant four scholars. And in the book, they basically, one puts forward their, you know, their propositions, and then the other ones kind of argue with it. And then it just go, goes back and forth. Yet I opened the book and on page one, I read a sentence that completely shocked me. Page one, all four Bible scholars, two complementarians, two egalitarians, all agreed on this one statement. We believe one can build a credible case within the bounds of orthodoxy and a commitment to inerrancy for either one of the two major views we address in this volume. Although all of us view our own positions on the matter as stronger and more compelling. Here was Thomas Schreiner and Craig Blomberg, two of the most brilliant complementarian scholars that I respect, saying that you could believe that women can be elders and still have a credible case within the bounds of orthodoxy and a commitment to inerrancy. And I was like, hmm. Deep down, I didn't believe that was true. Deep down, I believe that if you ordained women as elders, you had gotten a little too loose with the scriptures. You had been too influenced by culture. And so I was like, wait a second, if these two brilliant men who that I respect are complementarians are saying that this is a valid view within the bounds of orthodoxy and one can hold an inerrant view of scripture, 
then I don't understand this topic very well. And so I read that book, and then that led me to reading a lot more books over the last two and a half years. Um, to date, I've read now 22 books on this topic. It's, it's, it's messed with my brain over the last two and a half years in a way that I, I mean, if you are close to me, you've heard me talk about this. Um, I haven't talked about it much from up here, but, but, but it has consumed my living, my thinking so, so much. And so what I want to do tonight is really um, dive into how, over the last couple of years, did I get to a spot from, no, women cannot be elders, to, yes, I believe women can be elders, and then even the process, what that looked like for us as an eldership team, us as a leadership team, and then us as a family of churches and the whole process with that. So tonight, the main outline is going to look like this. Biblical interpretation, we're going to dive into that. Then biblical narrative, then biblical passages. Then we'll look at some common concerns that people generally have, and then some Q and A. Okay, so let's start with biblical interpretation. Um, I want to define our terms first because I'm throwing out some phrases that may not be too familiar for some of you. And so there's really two main camps. It's complementarianism and mutualism. Um, complementarianism is the Christian view. These are both brothers and sisters in Christ. This is, you know, complementarianism is the Christian view that believes while women and men are equal, there are specific tasks and offices that women are prohibited from. Complementarians believe that only men can hold the office of eldership in the local church. Some complementarians believe women can lead and teach in limited capacities, which is where I was, but most complementarians believe women are prohibited from exercising authority over men in the church and home. Okay, so as a church, Restored LA, we've been complementarian since our beginning eight years ago. Whether or not you've, this is the first time you've ever seen this word, that's what we were. And, and some of you um, knew that because of, you, you, you know some of this stuff. And others of you, when we sent out the email saying we were going to be ordaining women, some of you were like, whoa, I thought we already had women elders. And so there's been some confusion because I was what you would call a soft complementarian. This is not kind of like my banner that I wave in the sky. Uh, so we didn't talk about it very much. Uh, but this is the view of complementarianism. And it's the view of many, some of you in, in, this, in this room right now. Um, I want to be really clear tonight, while I am certainly trying to make a case for mutualism, the end goal of tonight is not to draw a line in the sand and say, if you disagree with me, out. You're, you're welcome to disagree with me. Um, th this is a safe space for you to process. This took me two and a half years. So to expect after a 90-minute lecture that you're like went from here to here, I think it'd be really unfair of me. And so we are going to have space in our church family for both complementarians and mutualists as we always have. When we announced to our gospel community leaders um, a couple of months ago that we were moving toward um, mutualism, ordaining women elders, there were a couple of GC leaders who texted me right back and said, I've been there for a long time. And I was like, cool. Thanks. Love you. They're like, yeah, we just, we disagreed with you for a while, but like, we respect you. We love this church and we're here. I was like, that's, I love you. Thank you. That's how we should be able to handle disagreements in the local church. So that's complementarianism. Mutualism. Mutualism is the Christian view that believes women and men are equal and both called and empowered to hold any office of church leadership based on their character and gifting. Mutualists believe that gender is never a biblical reason why someone is prohibited from leading in the church. Egalitarianism is synonymous with mutualism in many ways, but I prefer the word mutualism because it does not carry the political baggage or negative connotations some associate with egalitarianism. Some extreme versions of egalitarianism believe there are no distinctions between men and women, which I do not believe is biblical. The Bible is clear that men and women have both similarities and differences, and the term mutualism highlights the fact that men and women are mutually called to partner together in advancing Jesus' kingdom without any leadership restrictions related to one's gender. So that is what position we will be moving into as Restored LA. One last term to define is elders. Uh, elders are the qualified leaders in the local church who exercise the highest level of oversight and authority. They exercise primary responsibility to govern, guard, and guide the church family into maturity and health. 
And so that's really what we're debating. Um, we're, we're talking about can women be elders? And, and, and as we go through biblical interpretation, all of these things, I'm going to be making a case that women can and should be elders alongside men. Sometimes when I've been talking to some of you, you're like, wait, so you think the elders should only be women? No, I think that would be really unhealthy. We need both men and women. So we're not like, I'm not just like, oh, woe is me. I'm stepping down. Men are the worst. Not what I'm saying. Mutualism saying men and women together as elders. So let's move forward into this first area of biblical interpretation. We did a, a version of this um, a couple of months ago as we were preaching through Genesis, so I'll kind of make this part quick. But I think it's really important to begin this conversation around biblical interpretation. Oftentimes what happens in this debate is what Sarah and I did on Facebook 15 years ago. Here's a Bible verse. Here's a Bible verse. Here's a Bible verse. Here's a Bible verse. It's like, cool. Went nowhere. What does that verse mean? We can't just open up the Bible, point to a verse and say, see? It's like, what, 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 what are we talking about? What, when, is this in the Old Testament? Is this in the New Testament? Who is this written to? What's the context of this? And so one of the ways I want to show us and remind us that we can't, when we talk about this passage, we talk about this topic, we can't just grab one top passage and see, see, here's what it is. And that's how I really held my complementarian views for years. I knew two verses that were pretty clear on the surface, and I said, there they are, no arguing with them, there we go. And so here, as a reminder, why we need to be able to interpret the scriptures is because the Bible says things that without context could get us into a lot of trouble. Here's our little challenge. Exodus 31, 15. Think about how you would read this verse. Work may be done for six days, but on the seventh day, there must be a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Anyone who does work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. Who worked yesterday? Okay, this is a Bible verse. We need to understand context. Is it in the Old Testament or New Testament? Old Testament. So for some, I was like, oh, come on, silly. That's, that's ridiculous. That's in the Old Testament. Sure. But, but this is the danger we get ourselves into when we just say, look, here's a verse. Here's another one in the Old Testament. You're not to make gashes on your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord, Leviticus 19. Are Christians allowed to get tattoos? It's a question. We can debate. It's Old Testament. Does that matter? We're under the New Covenant. Okay, New Covenant though, even in the New Testament, there are commands that we still, it seems really clear, but then we all wrestle with. Here's one. Jesus in John 13. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. See, when, when we read the Bible, all of us are interpreters. Whether or not you think you are, you're like, no, I just read the Bible as it is. The classic phrase, uh, Bible, st Bible um, bumper sticker that says, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. It sounds really cool and profound and wise, but no, no, the Bible says it, I have to interpret it. And, and then, yes, but, but here, here's, the Bible says it, Jesus says it, wash each other's feet. Most of us will go, well, come on, you know, we don't, that was a different time, they had sandals back then, it's more about serving. Cool, I agree with that, but that is an interpretation. It's not the plain reading of the passage. Here's another one, I'm trying to bring this one back. Greet one another with a holy kiss, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, Right? Like, like this, my mom every once in a while comes on Sundays and she kisses me. I'm like, people don't know you're my mom. Really like, <laughs> just, they, yeah. So um, this is New Testament. This is the Apostle Paul telling the church of Corinth, greet one another with a holy kiss. Is that cultural? Is that a command that we're all disobeying? What do we do with this? Here's one last one. It's one of my favorites. 2 Timothy 4, 13. When you come, Paul's writing to Timothy, be sure to bring the coat I left with Carpus at Troas. Also bring my books and especially my papers. Like, like, are we supposed to read that verse in the daily morning devotion time? Be like, we got to go find Paul. He told us to bring his books and the papers. It's like, no, no, he was, he, Paul's writing to Timothy 2,000 years ago. And this is kind of like the end of his letter. And he's just like, hey, well, when you're coming, bring my coat, bring my books. And this, how does this apply to you and I? It, it's a little bit more difficult than we may want to admit. When we're interpreting the Bible, there's three main things. There's a bunch of different contexts, but there's three main things we constantly have to look at. The first is the historical context. When was this written? Who was this written to? How we read Exodus should be different than how we re read Romans. 
okay? Exodus was written like 15th century BC. Romans was written first century AD. Romans was written to Christians. Exodus was written to Israelites. Like that's different. We have to first understand the historical context. Next, we need to understand the literary context. When a passage says something, is it to be taken metaphorically? Is it to be taken literally? Is it to be taken uh, allegorically? There's different ways of understanding the genre. How we read the book of Psalms is different than how we read 2 Kings. And and, and so it's important for us to understand the the literary genre. When Jesus in John 10 says, I am the gate, he's not speaking literally. You would misinterpret the Bible if you thought he was literally a gate. He's speaking metaphorically. So to interpret it accurately, you have to read it in its literary context where he meant it to be understood as a metaphor as opposed to be taken literally, okay? And the third is the canonical context. When did this take place in the story of God? In the creation, in the fall, was this to Israel? Was this the redemption, the church, or the new creation? And so we have to be able to place our, the Bible verses that we're looking at in the right place. And unfortunately, oftentimes, when we're talking about this topic, We just grab random verses and go, see, it's clear. And all I'm trying to say tonight from this simple challenge is even verses that can seem clear on the surface aren't always what they mean. And so this is why we need to study the word of God very closely. So next section, biblical narrative. What I want to do is is trace the six main scenes, N.T. Wright helped me get some language for this. Oftentimes people say there's four main scenes in the Bible, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Yes and amen. I, N.T. Wright was the one who, who pointed out that we should add Israel and the church into those two things. Because if you only have context for creation, fall, redemption, and new creation, you're going to miss the vast majority of the Bible. Israel is, re- this is why the Bible is so confusing to most people. You have no context for Israel. And so you're reading the Old Testament, you're like, where's Jesus? What's going on here? Like, is this for me? What's happening? And then the church is everything after the gospels. That's significant in the New Testament. And so I want to trace each of these scenes as we look through the lens of God's heart for men and women throughout the story of God. And so we'll begin with creation on the first pages of the Bible. Genesis 1 and 2. We cannot begin to talk about men and women without unpacking the first two pages of the Bible. When we look at Genesis 1 and 2, we catch God's heart for his original intent and design for men and women. Uh, The first passage I want us to look at is Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. This is page one of your Bible. This is not something you skim. This is essential for us understanding men and women. And on page one of your Bible, God creates man and woman both fully in his image, and after he creates them, he commissions both of them to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, and rule. He did not say, hey, Adam, your job is to subdue and rule. Eve, your job is to multiply and fill. To both the man and the woman, he says, here's your job description. Go. It devastates me that that one of the complementarian books I read literally separates this command and says, here's what men are called to and here's what women are called to. It's like, not according to Genesis 1. They need each other to do this. 
How's Eve going to multiply and fill without Adam? How's Adam going to rule and subdue the earth without Eve? It's impossible. They were made for one another. They, They need each other. So here's my main proposition for the creation. In the beginning, man and woman were created equally in God's image and given the same authoritative tasks to multiply, fill, and rule the earth, okay? Genesis 1 and 2, the ruling that takes place is a co-ruling as equals. Now, here's the challenge. Complementarians, and I, where I was at for, for all of my Christian life until last couple of years, No one really sees any difference in Genesis 1, just a few. Genesis 2 is where complementarians go, no, 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 this is where the differences are. Genesis 2 is when God creates Adam first and then creates Eve as a helper. And they use many different inferences from Genesis 2 to go, there is a hierarchy in creation between man and woman, which there's a lot of arguments. And I go through uh, six of them in the book, briefly, and we could talk way more about them. But, but here's, I used to know, the, I knew those arguments, but as I began to study, I saw that they began to crumble very quickly on examination. One of the main arguments that was so just simple as a complementarian was that Eve is literally called Adam's helper. It's like, look at that. Like, that, if there's higher, like, that seems to be some level of hierarchy. Adam created first, Eve's his helper. Done. If there's some level of authority or ruling, Man's first, woman supports. Um, now, the problem with that is the word is there for helper, where God creates Eve. The vast majority of times that word is used in the Old Testament is to describe God himself. Okay? So, here's one example of many. The psalmist in Psalm 40. I am oppressed and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my helper and my deliverer. My God, do not delay. Would anyone read this verse and go, wow, the psalmist is above God because God is his helper? No, no, no. no. In, in fact, it almost seems to be the opposite. It's, it's that he needs help. And so he's calling on God to be his helper. And so the idea that Eve is Adam's helper does not mean any form of authority or hierarchy. Another main argument that was often used was in Genesis 3, um, in Genesis 2, and depends on how we translate some of this, uh, but also in Genesis 3, Adam names Eve. And, and, and in Genesis, one of the things Adam does is he names the animals. And so there's some argument from complementarians like, hey, if you name something, you have authority over it. And here's Adam naming Eve, so he must have some level of authority over her. Okay? Again, the problem is the Bible. Genesis 16:13 says, so Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her, you are Elroy, for she said, in this place have I actually seen the one who sees me. So just chapters later, Hagar is naming God, Elroy. Does Hagar have authority over God because he na- she named her, him? No, of course not. And so, so what I began to see was all of the complementarian arguments that, that I've ever seen they begin to, cr- they sound good on the surface, but they begin to crumble on, on further examination. And I was like, uh-oh, these seem to be more read into the text than actually something that you get out of the text. And, and, and this is something even the true, my professor, sem- um, seminary professor, Dr. Gary Brashears, he is a complementarian. I love him. I respect him. I trust him a ton. He and I disagree on this. Um, and I'll, but even he is a complementarian who believes that only men can be elders he sees no distinction between men and women in the first two chapters of the Bible. He thinks it comes in Genesis 3, which is where I think everything takes place. The fall. This is one of the crucial areas that I did not understand in the arc topic of mutualism and complementarianism. When we look at creation, we see man and woman both equally co-ruling. God gave them both the same authoritative tasks. When does man begin ruling over woman? It's in the fall. After Adam and Eve sin, God gives curses and consequences to their sins. And one of the main consequences to Eve, the woman, in Genesis 3.16 is this. He said to the woman, 
I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. Genesis 1 and 2, they are co-rulers, equal image bearers. Now Genesis 3, sin has entered the world, it's fractured everything, and God says, you're going to desire your husband, and he's actually going to rule over you. I looked at history, I looked at the world, and I generally saw men ruling over women and said, well, this just must be the way God made it. And I missed the fact that this was a consequence of the fall. This was not because of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. The question that we'll have to answer is, is this something that we should perpetuate or is it something that we should fight against? So in Genesis 3, we see the fall. Men exclusively ruling over women is a result of sin, not a part of God's original design. Now, I want to be really careful and clear here. Ruling in and of itself is not a bad thing. God rules over us. There's ruling that takes place that is good and beneficial and flourishing. Adam was commanded to, Adam and Eve were commanded to rule over the creatures, the, the, the animals. And yet, as they did that, that was supposed to bring about flourishing. They weren't ruling over the animals by killing them. They were to rule over them by bringing them life. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3 takes place, and now it's almost as if Adam's ruling over Eve as if she were one of those creatures. And this is where I see the major problem of men exclusively ruling over women as a part of the fall, not a part of God's original creation. And as we continue to read the Old Testament, we see this pattern over and over and over throughout Israel's story. Patterns in the Old Testament narrative are not necessarily meant to be repeated in the New Testament church. This was one of those things that was so confusing to me because you read the Old Testament, you're like, well, it seems like men are kings, men are priests, men are primarily prophets. There's some women prophets in there, but it's like, it's a, feels like a very man story. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, it's like lots of dudes all over the place. Clearly this is like a man's Bible. It, it used to be a convincing argument for me that I would be like, well, therefore, men dominate the pages of the scripture, so therefore, there's some level of authority. But I had missed the fact that that's exactly what God said would happen as a result of the curse. Men will dominate the pages of the scriptures. Men will dominate the history of the world as a part of the curse, not as a part of his original design. Kevin DeYoung, a complementarian, <clears throat> he writes, while the Old Testament doesn't mean to give us explicit instructions about men and women in the church, the Old Testament does show us a lot about men and women in general. And these patterns ought to shape how we think of sexual differentiation and complementarity in life and ministry. I agree with some of that, but I disagree with a good chunk because he then takes some of the patterns from his book, from the Old Testament, and goes, here are the patterns we should continue to follow. And those two main patterns that he talks about, he says that from the Old Testament, we only see men expressing official leadership and we only see men as priests. And because of those two truths, men are supposed to be the leaders. Men are supposed to be the authoritative rulers in that sense. Now, the problem with seeing men as the only, only men expressing official leadership in the Old Testament is there are exceptions. Deborah is a wild exception. Now, please hear me. Some of you are... Um, some of you are well-versed in this enough to where you even hear the name Deborah and you're like, oh, come on. That's where I was at. I would hear Deborah's name and I, seriously, the night 15 years ago, Sarah brought up Deborah in our argument and I was like, oh my gosh, Deborah. Like I literally, I didn't even respect the woman because people would use her as an argument. And so I'd be like, whatever. And I even said, well, it's because there were no godly men to step up. Lord, thank you for not killing me. Um, The, the problem with that, there's so many problems with that statement. Um, one, it's not true biblically. Uh, they're, 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 there's, the Bible does not say that, okay? So you're adding to scripture. Two, her husband seemed to be a pretty legit dude. Um, and Barak, who was, he didn't do everything perfectly, but he seemed to be a pretty good dude as well. Um, another problem with that is the book of Judges, God has no problems using really jacked up men. Samson, Gideon. It's not like God was like, oh, we, got, we got no men. Deborah, come on. He's got plenty of men 
who are well, it could, yeah, he could have chosen men. He didn't. He chose Deborah to be a judge over Israel. In Judges chapter 4, verse 4 to 5, Deborah, a prophetess, so she's a prophet, and the wife of Lapidoth was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to settle disputes. The, this is before the kings came into place in Israel's history. The judge functioned as the leader of the people. If, if she does not have authority, if she is not a leader in the Old Testament, I don't know who is a leader. Like, like she is exercising so much authority and leadership as a role, as a judge. And so we must go, well, e- uh-oh, you have to do something with Deborah. Um, and, and, and the fact is, she proves that God, yes, God generally used men. The Old Testament has a lot of men. We, we, we'd be foolish to not acknowledge that. But the fact that there's even just one judge who's a female, it, and, and it's not just that she was a judge as a woman, because in Judges it might be like, well, maybe she was a shady judge like the others. She wasn't. Nijay Gupta, Bible scholar, he says this, Deborah is the only judge give an extensive narration of whom nothing negative is said or implied. In fact, her narrative episode ends with a beautiful song of triumph and praise of God sung together with her military partner, Barak. In one of the darkest eras of Israel's history, Deborah stands as a singular but intensely bright luminary. So you have to do something with Deborah. One of the other arguments that Kevin DeYoung says was just men only leading, and then the men are only priests. Now, that was a pretty good convincing argument to me for a long time. Only men could be priests in the Old Testament, okay? That's a fact. I'm not trying to ever argue that. The question is, why? The problem is the Bible just doesn't say. It's easy to begin saying, here's why. But if the Bible doesn't say, God never says, only men can be priests because A, B, and C. Because they're the authoritative leaders. He just doesn't say that. So we're left to guess why only men are priests in the Old Testament. Taron Williams, in his excellent book, How God Sees Women, he gives three random ideas of maybe why men only were priests. Here's what he says. First, the law of Moses deemed menstruating women to be ceremonially unclean and therefore not permitted to even set foot in the temple for a quarter of every month. Second, having female priests may have caused a potential association with priestesses in pagan religions who combined prostitution with worship. Third, priests needed to be physically strong. They needed to physically defend and if need be, execute anyone who unlawfully came into the temple. All day long, they cut up and carried around animals. And in the first 300 to 400 years of the sanctuary's existence, the priests would have, would have to keep on packing up and carrying the entire sanctuary and all its furnishings from place to place. In this sense, excluding women from priesthood in the temple was as natural as a limitation as excluding women from Israel's army. I read that. I was like, decent. Again, not perfect. I'm not even fully persuaded by all three of them. Like, that's the reason why God... I'm just using that as an example to say, maybe that's why. The Bible doesn't tell us. So his guesses of why women weren't are as good as your guesses of why only men were priests in the Old Testament. So neither of those examples limit why women couldn't be elders in the New Testament church. Next step, redemption. We're almost there for a break. Kind of, halfway. An outline, I don't get to lie to you very well, but you'll see. Um, Redemption. Old Testament ends. Jesus shows up on the scene. Israel was unfaithful, did not fulfill the the desires God had for them. So God sends his own son, the true faithful Israelite, who's going to fulfill their failures. The question we ask often, talk about, why did Jesus come to earth? The, The classic answer is to die for our sins. Yes and amen. He had to die for our sins. But as you read the New Testament, there are a lot of different reasons why it says Jesus came to earth. One of the many reasons is found in 1 John 3, 8. It's not a very commonly known verse. It says, the one who commits sin is of the devil. Maybe that's why not many people talk about it. But the devil is sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Why did Jesus come to earth? 
to die for our sins? Yes, but also to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy and reverse the curses of what took place in Genesis 3. Jesus came into the world to inaugurate his kingdom and destroy the devil's works, which includes the end of men exclusively ruling over women. And as we see the New Testament, we are overwhelmed by the way Jesus loved and treated women. It is a very, very different way than than, than still to this day, most women have ever experienced a man. And this is 2,000 years ago. In Luke 8, 1 to 3, we see that Jesus had women disciples, and not only women disciples, but women who paid and partnered with him to advance his ministry. Luke 8 says, afterward, he was traveling from one town and village to another, preaching and telling the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. Those were men, the 12 apostles, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary called Magdalene. Seven demons had come out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who were supporting them from their possessions. Who's bankrolling the mission and ministry of Jesus? Some gals. And Jesus isn't like, hey, stop that. That's weird. Like, hey, it's a man's world. We've got to take care of ourselves. He's like, thank you. We need more money. Thank you. W- women are his disciples. This is unheard of in this day of women disciples following a Jewish rabbi around. And we see multiple instances. The woman at the well, when Jesus is talking to this woman in John 4, the disciples come back, they're like, what are you doing talking to a woman? He's like, what are you, (laughs) I'm loving and serving an image bearer. Like that's, that's what we do. And it was so uncommon in that day for women to be treated with respect from men. Jesus came to reverse this curse. John Stott says, without any fuss or publicity, Jesus terminated the curse of the fall, reinvested woman with her partially lost nobility, and reclaimed for his new kingdom community the original creation blessing of sexual equality. That that's what Jesus came to do. One of many things he came to do. He came to reverse what took place in Genesis 3 where man was going to exclusively rule over woman. Jesus came to reverse that curse. And now we're living in the age of the church where we should be seeing and experiencing more of that. The early church celebrated and included women who led, taught, and exercised authority. When we turn the pages from the Gospels into Acts and we go to Pentecost, Peter's first sermon, when he preaches and 3,000 people get saved, here's what Peter preached on that first day. Peter stood up with the 11. He raised his voice and proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, which we're currently living in, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. Later on in the sermon, Peter gets up and says, God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. God in Acts is doing a new thing. It was prophesied that there would be a new work, that one day, in the last days, the Spirit of God would be poured out on both men and women. Here is a wild fact. Taryn Williams says, In the entire Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, there's no record of the Spirit being poured out on a slave, a Gentile, or a woman, only on free Jewish males. 
yet prophesied in the Old Testament by Joel saying something new is going to happen. The Spirit of God will fall on men and women. We see in Acts 10, the Spirit of God falls on Cornelius, a Gentile, and all the Jewish disciples are like, is this legal? And he's like, Peter's like, yeah, like, they, I think that's what Jesus came to do. He's doing something new. And so this is what we see. I want to look at just a few women in the New Testament church, all from Romans 16. There's way more, but I want to just look at three for the sake of time and just show you that women were leading in the early church. The first one is Prisca or Priscilla. Romans 16.3. <clears throat> This is Paul at the end of his letter to the Romans. We preached Romans a couple years ago. I did spend some time talking about this. because I was in the middle of like my whole journey of learning about this. And I was just shocked at the amount of women that Paul names at the end of his letter who are co-workers of his. Romans 16 says, Give my greetings to Prisca and Aquila. Fascinating. Paul names her first. We could get into that later. A married couple. My co-workers in Christ Jesus who risked their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. Greet also the church that meets in their home. Okay, guys, Prisca and Aquila, this epic couple that we see quite a bit throughout the New Testament. She's also called Priscilla. Priscilla is like a nickname. Paul calls her a co-worker in Christ Jesus. This is the same word he uses to describe Timothy, Luke, and Titus. He says that she, and obviously her husband is included, but, but let's focus on her for a minute. She risked her own life to save the Apostle Paul's life. And Paul doesn't say, what are you doing? You're a woman. Stop doing stuff like that. He goes, well done. Way to risk your own life to help me out. He then says, not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. Celebrity Christian, she's one of the first. All of the Gentile churches, when they heard the name Priscilla, they're like, dang, she's legit. Can, if you see her, thank her for what she's done to our church all the Gentile churches. And then just to top it off, greet the church that meets in their home, not his home. They're, they're leading a church together. This is Prisca. Not only do we see her leading, but we also see her teaching another man in Acts 18. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was competent in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus, although he knew only John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Okay, Priscilla and Aquila, they're like, this dude can preach, but he's just a little off. So they lovingly go, hey buddy, come over. And they both correct and teach him. They explain the way of God more accurately to him. A man, a woman and a man are doing this together. This wasn't a, a Priscilla on the side as Aquila is doing the teaching. Her name is mentioned again first. The majority of time this married couple is mentioned in the scriptures, her name comes first. Most scholars go, that's pretty wild and probably speaks of her prominence in the ministry. Here she is teaching Apollos. Not just Priscilla, but also Phoebe comes next in the letter. Or she's actually at the beginning. Romans 16, 1, 2. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Cancrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people. Okay, including me. I use the NIV here because the CSB in some translations just call her a um, servant. The word servant is diakonos in the Greek. And sometimes translators say it's a deacon, it's an official title. Other times they just say it's a servant. It's hard to know other than context. Some translators, the NIV go, no, we think it's actually the office of deacon. Others think it's just the 
being a, not just, just being a servant. That's what Jesus literally says. I came to be a diakonos. Um, and so it's, it's a big deal. So he greets Phoebe. Phoebe is the one who brings the letter to the Romans. Think about this for a moment. A lot of people say that Romans is the greatest letter ever written. Paul had never visited the church at Rome. He writes the epistle to the Romans and he looks around and goes, I need somebody to go deliver this to the church at Rome, a church I've never been to. Phoebe, here you go. The fact that he entrusts this to a woman is fascinating. The fact that she is called a servant, a deacon, that he says, help her in any way. She's legit. She's been the benefactor of many people, including me. Who's helping bankroll Paul's ministry? Phoebe. This, this gal is impressive. Here's a question. If you've ever read the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, you know it's complicated. It's challenging. There's a lot. We spent almost a year preaching through it. When a church that had never met Paul in person receives a beautiful but dense letter, you think there may have been some questions. Probably. I have questions. Chapters 9 to 11, whoa. Who, who do you think they would have asked for clarification on the things that Paul had said? Probably Phoebe. Phoebe. Probably the one who's hand delivering the letter. Now, is that in the Bible? It's not. But I, it's harder to imagine that she's like, I don't know anything. Here's a letter. I got to go. I'm just working for FedEx. We'll see you later. It's not what's happening here. She, she's, she's an impressive leader in the early church. And here's the last woman we'll look at in the early church. Romans 16, 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. Married couple, probably, Andronicus and Junia. Devastatingly, in the Middle Ages, Bible translators were so confused how Paul could call this person Junia an apostle that some Bible translators added an S to her name to make it a male name, Junius. They're like, outstanding among the apostles? Couldn't have been a woman. So they made her a man. The problem was, later on, scholars were like, there's no person ever named Junius in the first century that's a man. This is a made up name. This is a woman. Her name is Junia, and yes, she is an apostle. She is outstanding among the apostles. Here's a wild quote from John Chrysostom. He's an early church father who would probably be not very happy with my talk right now because he believed that male only could be elders. He's in heaven now. Maybe he thinks this talk is great. We'll see. <laughs> John Chrysostom in the fourth century says this about this passage. To be an apostle is something great, but to be outstanding among the apostles just think what a wonderful song of praise that is. They were outstanding on the basis of their works and virtuous actions. Indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. That's a dude who did not think women should be elders. And he goes, she must have been legit. An apostle, a church planter, an apostolos, a sent one commissioned by Jesus. And she's not just one of the many. Paul goes, she's outstanding among them. Here's the question. Brad, were any of them named elders, though, in the New Testament? This is where I was at. About a year and a half ago, I would have heard this presentation. I'd be like, this is cute. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But they're not called elders. Paul never calls them elders. Is that true? That's true. How many people does Paul call an elder in the New Testament? Zero. Take that in. Paul never names a single person as an elder in the local church. There are only two people in the entire New Testament who self-identify as elders. And there's even some debate if they're talking about the official office of eldership or if they're just older men. Peter and John. So I used to go, well, no women named elders in the New Testament? 
Clear as day. Well, there's two guys named elders. If there were a hundred men named elders in the New Testament, it'd be like, this is a little tough sell. Paul's less infatuated about titles and offices than I think I am often. He's saying, these women taught, these women led, these women were apostles, they were deacons. Were they elders? The Bible doesn't say. But, but as we'll see in a little bit, the New Testament isn't as crystal clear about what the office of eldership is that I'd love. All right, let's finish this off with new creation. This is the quickest one, then we'll take a little break. New creation, at the end, the sixth scene. Man and woman will reign together with Christ in the new heavens and new earth. My complimentary, I, I wrote this in the book. All of it, most of this is in the book. I sent this. Most of my complimentary and friends are like, we agree with this one. I'm like, cool, we should agree on some stuff. Yes, so I'm, I'm not trying to say like everything I'm saying is brand new for the mutualist. But men and women will reign together with Christ in the new heavens and new earth. Revelation 22 says this. Then he showed me, John, says he showed me the river of the water of life. As we look at the new creation, we're going to see glimpses of Genesis 1 and 2. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. No more curse. There's a tree of life. There's a river. God's presence is there. We get so many glimpses, Genesis 1 and 2, in the new creation. And the men and women are going to rule and reign together forever. This is the six main scenes of the scriptures that I see God's heart and design for men and women to rule this earth together with each other and with him. Let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back. Love you all. All right, so here's what we're going to do. The last half is this. We're going to dive into the main passages in the New Testament, okay? Um, There are two passages in the whole Bible that appear to restrict women from the office of eldership. More specifically, there's two phrases in the Bible that seem to, on the surface, restrict women from the office of eldership. Um, There are other verses that we could debate, and I wrote about pretty much all of them um, in in this book. So afterwards, you can grab a copy. So I'm not addressing everything, but there's two main passages. It's 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Timothy 3. Okay, Titus 1 would be similar to 1 Timothy 3 because Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 are talking about the qualifications of elders and overseers, and they use the same phrase, husband of one wife, for an elder. It's like, well, that seems pretty clear. Yep, it does. And then 1 Timothy 2 is that passage where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. We'll dive into that. So those are the two big ones. We're going to look at both of them. Happily, they're both in 1 Timothy. So we need to understand a little bit of context about 1 Timothy. Um, few things. Who's the author? Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing the letter to who? Timothy. Timothy is his son in the faith, he, like one of his best friends. Now, I don't want to overplay this, but I want you to think about this for a moment. Paul, writing a personal letter to his friend, I believe God preserved the scriptures for us, absolutely. So so it shouldn't be shocking and there shouldn't be like Bible code hidden stuff in there. But it is important as we read it to go, you know what? Maybe they knew something that we didn't necessarily have, okay? Maybe there was a word used here that they had talked about beforehand, but but we don't have full context for. And so that's what we're gonna look at. I wanna give, uh, I wanna read the beginning of 1 Timothy 1, to show us that the location of this letter, where Timothy was when he received it, was in Ephesus. I think that's very, very important, okay? So here's 1 Timothy 1, 1 to 5, the beginning of the letter. Paul, 
an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and turned aside to fruitless discussion. Okay, so Paul at the beginning of the letter, very helpful. He's like, I'm writing this. My name is Paul. Who's he writing it to? To Timothy. Where is Timothy? In Ephesus. Why is he in Ephesus? To help guard the church from these false teachers who are infiltrating the church at Ephesus. First five verses of the letter. That's what's taking place. We have to read the whole letter in that context. And as you read all of 1 Timothy, you see that false teaching is all over the place. Okay? So, now let's get to the actual main passage. It's in chapter 2, verse 12 is the real debated one. But we're going to look at all of chapter 2 because context is helpful. We'll almost read through all of 1 Timothy here. Here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. For this I was appointed a herald, an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Just pause there for a moment. When I prayed earlier, how many of y'all raised your hands? Holy hands, men? Disobeying. Let's keep going. (laughs) Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls or expensive apparel, but with good works as is proper for women who profess to worship God. I won't, I won't point anybody out. Just, uh, just, you know, a woman here. Now we're getting into the, the debate. This is it. I mean, I, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of pages have been written about this. A woman is to learn quietly with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she's to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. But she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with good sense. That is one of two of the most clear passages restricting women from the office of eldership because it ties authority and teaching to this. Andrew Bartlett in I think one of the best books on the topic Men and Women in Christ, he addressing this specific passage says there's three crucial questions we need to ask of the passage. First, is Paul concerned with women exercising authority over men or something else? Two, Is the prohibition in 1 Timothy 2.12 only for the church gathering or all places? And three, is Paul's reference to Adam and Eve a creation principle or an illustration? Wonderful questions that often get denied. We just look at that one verse. Look, it's clear. End of story. We've got to do some deep dive asking some questions. So, is Paul concerned with women exercising authority over men or something else? Let's look back at verse 12. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority, in the Greek it's authenteo, over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. Okay. This word, authority. Again, in the Bible, the word authority is not a dirty, bad word. I want to be really clear about that. Paul uses the word authority all the time. When he uses the word authority, he usually uses the word exousia, 
That's his normal word for authority all throughout the New Testament. Here in this passage, Paul uses a different word for authority that is authenteo. Now you may be wondering, how many times does Paul use this word in the Bible? One time. This is the only time this word is used in the entire Bible. Authenteo. Now, usually when a word is used multiple places in the Bible, Bible scholars are able to go, yeah, contextually, here's what I think this means based on these other passages. When you're looking at a word that is only used once in the entire Bible, you're kind of left to guess. Ultimately, what Bible scholars do is they look outside of the Greek New Testament to other Greek sources around that time, how that word was used, and go, how best can we understand the word authentic? Now, Cynthia Long Westfall in that book, Paul and Gender, she's a brilliant Greek scholar. Here's what she says. In the Greek corpus, the verb authenteo refers to a range of actions that are not restricted to murder or violence. However, the people who are the targets of these actions are harmed, forced against their will, compelled, or at least their self-interest is overridden because the actions involve the imposition of the subject's will over against the recipient's will, ranging from dishonor to lethal force. Okay, so when we look outside the New Testament, try to figure out what this word means, it has massive negative connotations with it. It's not just, hey, don't exercise authority in a godly, good, loving way. Women don't do that. Paul has a word for that. He could have used exousia. And if that were the case, it'd be like, yeah, women, it seems to be like, you shouldn't do that, okay? He doesn't use it. He uses a word he's rarely ever used. Nijay Gupta, a Bible scholar, says, uh, a rare word may be because of a rare circumstance, okay? Continuing on, Cynthia Long Westfall, trying to find this word in other sources in the, the, the first few centuries, quotes John Chrysostom, who I already used. She says this, in fact, the closest parallel passage to 1 Timothy 2.12 is in Chrysostom's homilies on Colossians, where he commands husbands not to often tame their wives. Chrysostom says that the husband's role is to love and the wife's role is to obey. I would disagree. Paul doesn't use that language, but still, listen. He then says, therefore, don't often tame because your wife is submissive to you. So an early church father using the word authentane is using it in a way where he's even telling husbands, don't do this with your wife. Could it mean something negative? It appears to be so. Fascinatingly enough, when we look at New Testament translations, the CSB, most translations, well, some, they're all different. Um, but the CSB that I love, I really am grateful for, it says, I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she's to remain quiet, okay? If we rewind some 500 years ago to the King James Version, how it was translated, this is how it is. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence, it seems like this word authority is not a godly, loving authority where people flourish, but a negative type of domineering authority that would appear to be what Paul is saying should not be taking place. So, is Paul concerned with women exercising authority over men or something else? I think it's something else going on. The second question, is the prohibition in 1 Timothy 2.12 only for the church gathering or all places? This is really, really important. Most complementarians, I was, when I was a complementarian, I read that verse 212 that a woman wasn't allowed to teach or exercise authority over a man, and I said, well, that's just in the church gathering. The problem is that's not what 1 Timothy 2 says, okay? Look at the context for 1 Timothy 2. Therefore, I want the men where? In every place. Is he talking about the church gathering? No. In every place. He's talking about prayer. I think our brains go, well, you pray in the church. It's like, well, you should be praying in every place, just like Paul said. Lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing with decency and good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works. Again, I don't think he's just thinking you should do good works in the church gathering. 
or just be modest in the church gathering, as is proper for women who profess to worship God. Then at the end of the section, that's two, ten, ten um, what was it? Eight to 10. Then at the end, bookending this, 215, but she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with good sense. If you think 212 is only for the church gathering, you've got some challenges contextually with the passage. It starts with, hey, in every place, this is what I want you to be doing. And it ends with women bearing children. Is that happening in the church gathering? Pro- probably not. I think Paul's talking big picture here. So this begins to create problems. And this is one of the things that challenged me as a complementarian. I began to feel so many inconsistencies as a complementarian. I was like, ah, it was only in the church gathering, even though it doesn't say in the church gathering. It's just what it means. And the reason why it's hard to say this is universal is because you have issues or people like Deborah who are clearly exercising authority over men. You have women like Priscilla who are teaching men like Apollos. So we're like, "Uh uh-oh, does the Bible contradict itself? I don't believe it does. So it causes us to ask these questions. So is the prohibition of 1 Timothy 2.12 only for the church gathering or all places? Contextually, I think it's for all places. Third question. Is Paul's reference to Adam and Eve a creation principle or illustration? This is massive. Um, 1 Timothy 2.12. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she's to remain quiet. If it stopped there, I think most people could kind of work their way around things. Verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. So here was one of the main, the main reason I was a complementarian. It appears that this argument for women not to be able to teach men or have authority over men is rooted in creation, not in culture. And that to me was like, done. I don't need to hear anything else. Settled. Argument over. Here's the question Andrew Bartlett's asking. Does every time Paul mention the creation narrative, is he rooting the argument in creation or is he simply using it as an illustration? Now, John MacArthur, complementarian, commenting on this verse, he says, nor was Paul's teaching prompted by some cultural situation at Ephesus and hence not applicable today, as some argue. He not only appeals here to the creation account in Genesis 2, but also taught this same truth to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, 8 to 9. Now, here's where things get wild. Who knows what 1 Corinthians 11 is about? Head coverings. This is, as a complementarian, one of the most difficult things you got to wrestle with. Here's MacArthur, brilliant Bible teacher, taught me a lot. He is saying, because 1 Timothy 2 is rooted in creation, it's not mentioning cultural customs, it's true universally for all times and places. Seems good. But then he says the same thing Paul does in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's the problem with that. 1 Corinthians 11, you ready for one of the wildest passages in the whole Bible? Here we go. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman doesn't cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her head be covered. A man should not cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. So too woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. There's the creation. Adam, Eve came from Adam. He's referencing creation. That's what MacArthur is saying. This is what Paul, Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians 11. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. Okay, now track with me for a moment. Why don't we have women wearing head coverings in the church gathering? Paul's saying they should, and he references the creation narrative. John MacArthur even says, that's what he, he's doing that in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, when it comes to 1 Corinthians 11, John MacArthur's commentary, here's what MacArthur says. When Paul said a man disgraces his head if he has something on his head while praying or prophesying, he had to be referring to local Corinthian custom. It seems, therefore, that Paul is not stating a divine universal requirement, but simply acknowledging a local custom. 
That's problematic. But that's where you had to be as a complementarian who didn't think women should wear head coverings. So, so and here's, I have, I know of complementarians who wear head coverings as women. I go, cool, at least you're being consistent. I don't think that's what's happening here. But you have to do something with this because Paul mentions creation in both 1 Timothy 2 and in 1 Corinthians 11. You can't do one without the other. You don't get to say, well, this one's rooted in creation. And then he goes, this one is not rooted in creation. It's a cultural custom. Where did, where did it say in 1 Corinthians 11 it's a cultural custom? It doesn't. Paul says, Eve came from man. This is why we do it. So, so this, this is the inconsistencies I lived with for years. And I'm like, uh, just, it, it just has to be right. And, and I couldn't, as I kept studying, and I kept seeing these inconsistencies come to the surface. I was like, either Restored LA is going to have women wearing head coverings real soon. <laughs> or, or this is not what it's happening. That it's actually something different. So this is Andrew Bartlett again. Um, Bartlett's just lovely. Uh, he says this. But in reality, Paul's appeal to Genesis raises one of the most serious objections to the coherence of the complementarian interpretation. The problem is that the argument proves too much. If it is really the case that Paul understood the order of creation of Adam and Eve as establishing a principle that men are created to be the authoritative leaders of women, then there is no justifiable basis for restricting the application of this creation principle to leadership in the churches. Rather, it should apply across the whole of human life. Track with this for a moment. If Paul, which Paul could be saying, please hear me, maybe he is saying this. If Paul is saying men, women, excuse me, women cannot ever teach or exercise authority over men, and he roots it in creation, then how dare you work at a company that has any women in authority? How dare you live in a country that could have women exercising authority and teaching? You don't get to go, well, it was, in the it was just in the church gathering. It's not in the church gathering. He goes to the creation account. And it's not, 1 Timothy 2 is not about the church. So you're forced to mess around with this. And I, would, I, I was just like, uh-oh, do I think that women could be governors? Do I think women could be presidents? Do I think women could be in leadership? Now, again, I could be wrong. Maybe women can't be. Here's the problem with that. Deborah. Priscilla, other women in the Bible who are exercising authority over men and teaching. So either the Bible's contradicting itself or something's going on in this passage that is a little bit more culturally contextual. So here's the question. Do we know anything about the culture of Ephesus from the Bible or history that may make more sense of the interpreting of 1 Timothy 2? Yes. Acts 18 and 19. When we read about Paul planting the church in Ephesus, things get crazy. When Paul brings the gospel to Ephesus, here's one passage in Acts 19. About that time, there was a major disturbance about the way, Christianity. For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, who was a Greek goddess, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. What a great message. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin, the very one all of Asia and the world worship. When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This is Bible. We don't even have to look outside for culture to understand that Artemis had a massive impact on the church at Ephesus. We see it in Acts 18 and 19. Could something about false teaching messing with the church in Ephesus be a reason why Paul talks about 1 Timothy 2? Yes. What do we know about Artemis? Uh, Sandra Glown wrote a book, uh, Nobody's Mother. It's a, a recent book. It's a whole book. Ch check this out. It's a whole book about the Greek goddess of Artemis in the 
in Ephesus, according to a biblical interpretation and understanding. People write books about everything, literally. I read it, it was great. Here's what, I'm, I'm kind of quoting myself, quoting her from the book. What do we know about Artemis? Sandra Glenn, in her comprehensive book, Nobody's Mother, Artemis of the Ephesians in Antiquity and the New Testament, gives plenty of information that is relevant to the passage at hand. The predominant narrative in the city at the time Paul was writing was that the goddess Artemis was born in Ephesus. Artemis was the virgin daughter of Zeus and Leto. There's a footnote for you. She was born first before her twin brother Apollo. Fascinating. After Artemis was born, she helped her mother give birth to Apollo, acting as a midwife. She was worshipped as a goddess they perceived as a female hunter who provided midwifery services while rejecting sexual relations, which is why there's a lot of single women in the church that Timothy's wrestling with. As part of the goddess's ability to save, she was deemed one who could deliver a first century female through the most dangerous of passages, childbirth. Does any of that seem at all applicable to something Paul may be getting at in 1 Timothy 2? I think so. Let's go through it line by line real quick. 1 Timothy 2, 11. A woman is to learn quietly with full submission. That starts off the section. We look at that and go, yikes. It's the only imperative in the entire passage that a woman should learn. Pretty shocking for 2,000 years ago. Verse 12, I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. Okay, Paul's saying, remember that word, authentane, a domineering type of authority, usurping authority. Paul's saying, I don't allow women to do that. Where could women have learned a domineering attitude? Nijay Gupta, Bible scholar, says Artemis was notably an aggressive deity and violent. Is there a chance that the women disciples of Artemis had an aggressive spirit to themselves following a hunter goddess? Potentially. 1 Timothy 2, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 13 to 14. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. Okay, what is happening here? Here's what Sandra Glenn says. The truth that Adam was first and Eve was deceived restore interdependence in a context in which pride of creation order in a goddess first context emphasizes preeminence and autonomy. In the Ephesian origin story, Artemis came first, the woman. It's one of her titles in her own creation story with its female-male pairing, she is firstborn. The apostle corrects a false story with a true one. He's using narrative to counter a competing narrative. Why does he go back to the Genesis creation? Because a lot of these women and men who were part of the cult of Artemis were told woman was made first. And Paul's going, no, they weren't. Adam was. And in fact, Eve was the first one to get deceived. So any type of female superiority, Paul's going, na, 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 na. He's bringing it back down. The next passage, but she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with good sense. This passage is one of the wildest in the New Testament. This is one of the reasons why we cannot just look at a Bible passage and say, see, it's clear. It's women will be saved through childbearing. It's clear. So, well, that's kind of, it is clear. Let's be honest. It's clear. But the problem is it seems to contradict other passages that says we're saved by grace alone through Jesus. So, so what's happening here? Here again is Sandra Glam. How interesting that Paul brings up deliverance through childbirth in a context where false teaching is likely coming from the cult of the goddess of midwifery especially because he is bringing up a creation story to counter beliefs in a city that prides itself in its goddess's birth. Eve's consequence was pain in childbearing. Artemis was thought to deliver painlessly or euthanize women in childbirth, but Jesus is better. He will save through childbearing those who continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. I think that makes more sense of what's going on in 1 Timothy 2. You can disagree with that, but you have to create an interpretation that's still consistent. And I think the complementarian interpretation is way too inconsistent to hold. 
those who hold it consistently are, are patriarchalists who really believe that women should not be presidents, women should not be professors, women should not be doing any type of leading or authority or teaching anywhere in the world. I disagree with them vehemently, but I say, well done for your consistency. I think that's the other alternative to understanding 1 Timothy 2. That or this. The, the washy in-between middle thing, it, it, it lacks cohesion and consistency, and it was too difficult to hold for long. So let's look at the last passage. Wow. Okay. Q&A is going to be at six. Um, I'm here. I'm not leaving. First Timothy 3. This is the other main passage. <clears throat> this saying is trustworthy. If anyone, oh, sorry, just so you know, the last verse we just looked at, where is it? First Timothy 2.15. If you had your Bible open, the next verse is First Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. Okay. So our Bibles have headings in them, but no headings in the original letter. This is the next verse after the childbearing sentence. This saying is trustworthy. Sandra Glenn actually wonders if that's pointing back to verse 15 in chapter 2 as opposed to pointing forward to 1 Timothy 3 1. Anyways, I know you guys are really wanting to know my thoughts on that. But um, <clears throat> this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. That's the main phrase. Self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, <clears throat> able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. Okay. This is the other passage that seems to restrict women from eldership. And on the surface, it seems very clear that only men can do this. Elders, overseers. The word overseer is 1 Timothy 3. The word uh, elders is in used in t Titus 1. Almost identical qualifications. Pretty much everyone agrees overseers and elders are the same thing. Here's what I found. Most complementarians, myself included when I was one, believed that men could only be elders, but we held very loosely to this phrase, husband of one wife. Not only did I, but many complementarian scholars are arguing that what Paul is saying is not arguing about gender specifically, but about sexual purity when he says husband of one wife. Here are some quotes from complementarians, people who only believe men can be elders. Uh, I'm, I'm quoting myself, quoting a bunch of guys. Most complementarians acknowledge that this phrase, husband of one wife, is to be understood as addressing sexual purity, not gender. John MacArthur, commenting on what a husband of one wife means, says, Paul is not referring to a leader's marital status, as the absence of the definite article in the original indicates. Rather, this issue is his moral, sexual behavior. Okay? Thomas Schreiner, another complementarian scholar, he writes, the requirement for elders in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, and Titus 1, 6 to 9, include the statement that they are to be one woman men. Does not necessarily, in and of itself, preclude women from serving as elders. He's a complementarian because of 1 Timothy 2, not 1 Timothy 3. One last one, Douglas Moo, another complementarian, writes that this phrase may mean that the male elder overseer must be faithful to his wife without excluding unmarried men or females from the office. And then he adds, it would be going too far to argue that the phrase clearly excludes women. These are all from complementarians, brilliant scholars who do not think women can be elders. They're just saying 1 Timothy 3 is not the good place to argue. They all think it's 1 Timothy 2 which we just looked at, which is not the clearest passage in the world. So what's happening when Paul says uh, husband of one wife? Um, two reasons to believe this isn't about gender. One reason why we think it is about gender is because of all the masculine pronouns throughout the first Timothy three qualifications. He, 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 his, his, his. Those don't exist in the Greek New Testament in this section. There's no male masculine pronouns in this section. In fact, the first phrase, 1 Timothy 3.1, after Paul was just speaking to women, 
He says, whoever desires to be an overseer desires a noble task. He does not say any man who desires this desires a noble task. Philip Payne, brilliant scholar, says this, when Paul writes anyone in 3.1, he uses the Greek word tis, which is inclusive and gender neutral. It would be misleading to use tis without qualification to describe a group of limited to males. Furthermore, the preceding passage is about men and women. Paul had men and women in mind. If Paul had intended to teach that only men should be overseers, he would have said something like, any man who aspires to the office of overseer desires a noble task. But Paul does not say man. Paul says anyone, because Paul means anyone, man or woman. The, the, the very next thing, reason why we believe that it's, I believe that it's not about gender, it's about sexual purity, is because later in the same letter, two chapters later, 1 Timothy 5, 9, Paul's giving a list of rules for widows to be enrolled on a specific list for Timothy. And he uses this phrase, no widow is to be enrolled on the list for the support unless she is at least 60 years old, has been the wife of one husband. This is the exact same phrase inverted. Andrew Bartlett asks a brilliant question. Paul's purpose is not to lay down a requirement that the widow must have been married, for a widow necessarily has been married. Rather, his purpose is to lay down a requirement that she has proved herself to be chaste and remains so. Why would Paul be saying, hey, she has to be a one-man woman? Be because it's about sexual purity. It's, it's not about being a man married to a woman. So who... Um, Here's, here's one of the other challenges. We, we want to say, well, let's go back to 1 Timothy 3. When I was a complementarian, I was like, I just read the Bible as it is. Okay, this says an overseer, therefore, must be husband of one wife. And then it later goes on to say that he must manage his own child, household well. He has to have multiple children under control of all dignity. Here's why I know no one in this room actually believes we should take that literally. Because when we brought Jonathan Lopez up here as an elder candidate, as a non-married man, no one had objections. If you want to take this literally, some of you could have gone, hey Brad, kind of confused. First Timothy 3 says, he must be the husband of one wife. But Jonathan's not married and he doesn't have kids. A literal reading of this would require an elder to be married and to have children. Now, here's the thing. My professor, Dr. Gary Brashears, believes we should take this literally. He says, you, if you are an elder, you must be married, a man married, and have multiple children. It's not single child. Multiple children who are respectful, believers, faithful. I applaud his consistency. That's awesome. The main question I ask back is, so the Apostle Paul, who was single, and Jesus Christ couldn't have been an elder in the church? He goes, correct. Because they're not married. They don't have kids. I'm like, sorry, if Paul walks through that door, dude, take over the church. <laughs> I, I, the guy who wrote this, I, I think we're misreading it if we're like, Ah, I'd love to have you on eldership, Paul, but you don't have kids. I think we're missing something there. Now again, I could be wrong on that. Brashears could be right. He says it really clear here. Must be. So you have to interpret that. Is this about sexual purity? Is this about gender? I'm convinced it's about sexual purity. Okay? We're almost there. N.T. Wright, we'll land with him for this part. Though Paul refers to the overseer as a man, this is because Greek grammar normally refers to both genders together, and because in the early days of the church, the leaders of most communities were probably men. I don't see it as the barring women from this particular ministry and vocation. So, who can be an elder? Here's a question. How clear are the two clearest passages in the entire Bible for restricting women from eldership? Over the last two years, that went from very clear to very murky. So much so that I got into a spot over the last two years 
where I began to see what was a clear issue become very, very gray. And the grayer it got and the more confusing it got, the harder it was for me to look at, out at our church and restrict women from the potential of eldership. If it's clear, I'm ob- I'm, I will obey Jesus Christ. We obey him in a lot of difficult things. Not an issue to me. But if something is this fuzzy and unclear, I had to ask myself, why am I going to lean on the side that restricts women from the potential of eldership? Half of Jesus' church. What if I'm wrong? I've wrestled with that. James 3 says that not many of you should become teachers because you will be judged more strictly. That is weighty. What if I'm wrong? I believe I would stand before Jesus and and receive a rebuke of some sort. But I had to ask the question, what if I'm wrong about restricting women from eldership? That became far more terrifying to me. If Jesus goes, hey, you, you prevented half of my church from the potential of eldership over a couple of gray passages, where brilliant men and godly men and women on both sides disagree, you leaned on, the, on this side? I personally could no longer do it. And so it began a process of conversations over the last couple of years. We got a roll. I, I wrote a book about it so you could read a lot more. <laughs> oh my goodness. Common concerns. I'm, I think we have like one main common concern. We'll take a five minute break and then we'll do Q&A forever. Um, if we, here's the most common concern. If we make a change in this area, what's next? Totally fair. It's called a slippery slope. It's not a slippery slope argument. It's a slippery slope fallacy. And, and, and what it is is, hey man, maybe you kind of convinced me here, but this is a little dangerous. If we make this change here, what's next? Church, I, I stand before you and say I have zero, zero intention of changing anything else. I don't think this is a slippery slope at all. Here's why. Craig Keener, brilliant New Testament scholar, he's been a mutualist for 40 years. I think for some of you, one of the main concerns is first this and maybe we're ordaining same-sex marriage couples later. Craig Keener, 40 years, mutualist, believes women can be elders, does not believe that gay couples should be married because the scriptures are very clear on that. Every time same-sex relationships are mentioned in the scriptures, every single time, time. It's sinful and a no. That's why it's not gray. As we've seen over the last seven hours, there are passages that seem clear on both sides. And so this is why it's gray in a way that other issues are not. Here's what Craig Keener says. Oh, here's my statement. Ordaining women elders is not a slippery slope toward affirming gay marriage, radical feminism, or theological liberalism. Thanks to Josh Lewis for that. Craig Keener says this, the slippery slope in those particular denominations. There are some de- church denominations that w- at one point said, yep, women can be elders. And then decades later, we're like, and we're ador- ordaining same-sex couples. Some denominations have done that. In the book, I named dozen, a dozen that haven't. Okay, so it's not, it's not a necessity. The slippery slope in those particular denominations that affirm gay marriage is not simply that they decided to ordain women. It is that they decided to ordain women by rejecting what Paul said, rather than by understanding the historical context. It makes a difference. Do we track that? I'm not, this is where this would be wildly dangerous, and I hope you all would run for the hills. If I got up here, or rebuke me in church discipline, all that stuff. I always say run for the hills, and people are like, we need to discipline you if you're in sin. I know that's, it's, it's a phrase. Um, if I got up here, and for two hours I was like, guys, we need to ordain women, because it's 2024, yeah, <laughs> women's rights, yeah, women's march, yeah. You'd be like, get it, what is this guy doing? That's how some denominations came to the conclusion that women should be elders. It wasn't because of the Bible. They were like, well, Paul's a little crazy. Paul was a little, you know, he said some wild things. Let's stop trusting that. I'm not saying that. I think we've had Paul wrong when we haven't ordained women. I think Paul's right in what he said. We're not dismissing Paul's words. We're trying to take them as best we can and understand them. That's why I do not believe this is a slippery slope. Common concern. What if I don't fully align with the mutualist view? Am I still welcomed here? 
Let me say this as clearly as I can for the second time. Yes, 100%. This is not the line in the sand. Get out, you disagree with me. This is my church. This is what, as we've had mutualists in our church for years, we will have complementarians in our church for years. There's a beautiful diversity in the midst of that. Now, here's one difficult thing. I will, I will be honest. As we bring women elders on in the next year or so, there is going to need to be a respect and a submission on your end for that. You don't get to be like, I'm in the group. I submit to the male elders, but not the women elders. Like, this is not going to work for you. But we're even pushing this off at least six to nine months. We don't even know. We don't even have an official timeline when women elders would come on to give you space to process. I think it would be unfair. Stephen had this point as we were processing this all. Because originally I was like, let's do this talk and we can ordain women elders that night and woohoo. And, and Stephen was just like, it feels unfair to those who need time to wrestle with this, to process this. It would feel unfair to be like, hey guys, this is it. Here's three new women elders. Sucks to be you if you disagree. <laughs> it's like, no, we're, we're, we're giving space. We're giving time. Your members in this church, I am willing to sit down with any single one of you for as long as you want. Bible's open. We'll talk through. I've, one of the things I have talked about Many of you that we've talked about this, as much as I want to make this a Bible issue, it's not always a Bible issue. There's some family of origin stuff in here. There's some cultural baggage in here. There's church culture and tradition in here. And that's not to say it's all bad. But, 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 but we got to do the work of like, why am I so reactive to this? And, and, and so this is a safe space for you. You're, you're welcome. You could, you, could, you could challenge. You could disagree. You could talk. I'm happy to do that. Um, I wrote a book so that you could actually dive in. If you're like, this wasn't enough, I need more, which I know all of you are thinking. <laughs> read this. I am asking that every person read this before we meet to talk about this because I can't have 300 meetings saying that I couldn't do this with 300 people. It would kill me. So I'm asking everyone who wants to meet with me to talk through these issues, they have to watch this lecture, we're recording it, and they have to read the book. As soon as they do that, I'm, I will clear my schedule to make space to talk and process with you, okay? That's how serious. My biggest prayer over the last year has been this. Jesus Christ, would we not lose a single person over this? Not a single person. I, and I know, it's, I've told that to some pastors, they're like, you're crazy. I'm like, no, I, I really believe we can do this. I believe that if Jesus Christ is the true hero of his church, we can have men and women disagreeing on this issue. And it's fine. We disagree on stuff already. Let's just add this into another one. But like this does not need to be the final divisive issue. Are all the other restored churches embracing mutualism? Um, some are, some aren't, and I'll leave it at that for now uh, because some of them are still wrestling through all of this. This is, I'll be honest, this has been primarily me spearheading for the past two years. And in fact, some of you are like, whoa, this happened quick. It's not happened quick. I wish it happened quick. If I had it my way, this would, we would have been doing this talk a year and three months ago. And I, submitting myself to a family of churches, to a bunch of other friends and leaders who have said, we need to slow down. And I have painfully gone, please, <laughs> please just tell me when. And, and now is the time. And so each church is in the process. Some of the churches have, you know, um, in December this past year, uh, we, a bunch of us lead pastors went to Denver for a summit around this specific topic. Stephen was the only non-lead pastor. I dragged there because I was like, well, you've got to be here for this. This is so important. We sat with two brilliant, complementarian, egalitarian, mutualists to talk through it, to pray through it, to process it, to really just understand what's going on, how we're going to make this decision, how we're going to process all this stuff. And so um, by God's grace, we're unified in the midst of our disagreements on that. Five minute break. Then Q&A. Let me pray, because some of you are going to leave, and that's fine. I will not judge you. I know some of you are like, if I hear you say another word. Imagine if I preached this morning. You're welcome. Thank you, Allie. Um, I'm going to pray. Five minutes. If you want to roll, roll. If you want to stick around for Q&A, stick around. Write those questions down. You have to have it written down, um, and then we'll go. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. You know how, how much I've wrestled with you over the last couple of years on this. I thank you um, for this opportunity. I thank you for 
in this church family, Jesus, that, yeah, as I've shared this with, with a bunch of friends that are just like, whoa, this could divide the church, this could be crazy. I'm like, I don't think it will. We genuinely believe like our church like loves Jesus and we're not gonna, we don't need to fight. We can disagree, we can love each other. But, but this doesn't need to be divisive. Jesus, you care so much about unity. And so would you humble us? Would you give us love? Would you give us truth for one another? Thank you for your mercy on us. We love you. It's in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen.